Now you might wonder, now how does this differ from the Japanese samurai? Why do they have specific throwing techniques on how to throw people with armor? Well, the first thing that you need to know about Japanese warfare is that for a very long time, they favored a type of battle habit called yiji da. So what yiji da literally means that yi means one, ji means right, da means fight. So together that means that it's one rider versus one rider. It's basically what you often see in games today or in some kind of movie where you have two camps of military, they park the soldiers there and the you know, general or the samurai would then come up one on one and they would verse each other in almost like a jousting kind of contest to determine the victory of that particular battle. Now those of you that don't understand the Japanese military history will think, well that's pretty stupid, right? Why would I rely my entire victory outcome of this battle based on one person versus another? Well, it's a very interesting thing about ancient Japanese custom, right? First, firstly, their military, as I've mentioned, happens on a very small scale compared to China. You know, sometimes only 500 on each side, sometimes even less. You know, more, uh, the bigger armies goes up to a few thousand, very some they ever, ever reach 10,000. And out of these truths, besides the actual samurais, the rest of the soldiers are all farmers and these farmers, you can see them as they join the battle because they respect this particular samurai or the one who's leading them. And this formed a very interesting concept in their culture called Bing Ming Guan. Right? Bing means military, Ming means reputation, Guan means viewpoint. So together it means that in their custom, they kind of have this value system for the reputation of the general or the samurai that's leading the army. If this samurai is not well reputable, then the farmers would actually refuse to fight for him. And even during battle, these farmers, even though they have spear or whatever weapon, they don't actually care about the outcome because no matter whether they win or lose, they will still go back to farm their land. They don't actually get any benefit. Whereas in the Chinese military system, if you are doing well as a soldier, you can gradually get promoted and move up the military social ladder. But in Japan, because of the costing system, if you are a farmer, you're always a farmer. If you're a samurai, you're always a samurai. The class cannot change, which is why these farmers have no reason to risk their life in the fight, which is why they'll usually only join the army if they respect this guy, the samurai that's leading them. And that's basically based on the reputation. So if the one samurai say, I want to do a yiji da, right, one on one, if the other samurai refuse, then he actually loses reputation and there's a chance that the farmers following him will actually don't want to fight for him anymore. And often, when the two samurai battle out and one side loses, the, the, the losing side, the farmers will just scatter and run. They will not want to be part of this battle anymore and then the other side will naturally win. And even though, um, as I mentioned earlier, that Japan has a much higher ratio with samurai versus common foot soldier. But still, if you imagine each side have 500 troops in total, let's give a very generous number, let's say you know, 50 of them are samurai, 450 of them are common foot soldiers. If the two hit samurai battled out, and the ones that lost, and his 450 farmers ran off, then that 50 or even 100 samurai can't really win versus the other side samurai plus his farmers. And they will now have better morale and they will feel like victory is at the hand. And, and at that point, the farmers might actually be willing to put in the effort and blood and sweat to actually win this battle. Which is why, even though the most of the battle is relying on the samurai on each side, they still need the numbers of the farmer to support them in order to secure a victory. If the one side farmer decide to run, the other side will naturally win. Which is why reputation is very important and that's why they had this ancient habit of yiji da. And this custom has been kept in the Japanese uh, history for a very long time because if you keep in mind, Japan is, is a reasonably small island and they don't really have a lot of outside interference. Whatever they are doing, you know, it works against themselves and as long as everybody's on board with it, they are fine. They have an entire complicated efficacy as to what you can do and what you can't do during this kind of one-on-one -on -one du du dueling. This only really was challenged and eventually abolished when the Mongolians of the Yuan Dynasty invaded the Japanese sea border. 
Upon the first battle, the Japanese were preparing to do the, some, the same kind of tactic where the Mongolian just came up and stopped firing arrows at them and you know, started attacking them as they would do warfare in mainland China. And this eventually forced Japanese to realize that you know, their gentleman version of warfare is actually not that good versus outsiders. So even though the Mongolian could not conquer Japan due to you know, hurricane and typhoon, the Japanese, it did kind of give Japanese a new idea of battle, which is why if you look at the later stage of Japanese feudal uh, warfare from you know, the, the Sengoku period, they no longer really do these easy da one-on-one dueling. Instead, they have other formations and other tactics and they try to, to, you know, to use cheat, the deception, or kind of tactic and strategy to win battle rather than just see who samurai is better in a one-on-one -on -one duel. However, even though eventually the mode of battle changed, this kind of habit of samurai being able to one-on-one -on -one is still a very important part of the samurai culture, which is why while the shogun or the other lords and daimyos worries about tactics and strategies of the overall battlefield, the individual samurai really just focus on how many opposing samurai and soldier he could kill in any given battle. So another thing that I want you to take note is that due to the fact that samurais are often equated to European knights in the social class, there seems to be a misconception that samurais are all horse riding warriors. What this is true for knights is actually not true for samurais. Because Japan being a closed off island, it has a very limited amount of horse stock, which is why throughout the history most of the time, only the really elite samurais they are able to ride. And the lower class of samurai, in samurai also it's not just one class, they are you know more important samurai, less important samurai, they have social uh, rankings among samurai themselves, and the lesser samurais are more often foot samurai than horse samurai, and they represent the larger number of samurai that participate in any given battle. Now this is another reason why for them there is actual purpose for learning how to do throwing technique against armored foe because chances are if they lost a long weapon poem, if they lost a katana, if they lost a wakisashi, then they might still have a chance to win back the honor by using some kind of throwing technique. So we're adding the two things here. Firstly, the tendency of doing one-on-one -on -one duel, yi qi da, to maintain their fame and reputation and respect among the farmers that's backing them up. And on the other hand, the fact that there are more samurais fighting on foot than samurai fighting on horse, which is why throwing against armor foe is a useful thing back in the uh, feudal warfare. So that would be why they still have techniques that teaches you how to throw somebody wearing armor, whilst in China, the, the mode of combat is completely different, and therefore there's no room or reason for this type of technique to exist. As we've established already, if you look throughout the Chinese history, ever since the, the late Warring State to Han Dynasty, most of the enemies that the Chinese dynasties had to face are completely cavalry forces with no foot soldier, which is why wrestling on the perspective of Chinese uh, olden day warfare is just simply not useful at all. And of course, the habit of one-on-one -on -one dueling, known as Ichida in Japan, uh, is not that popular in China. There are some stories of you know generals taking one-on-one -on -one duels, but they do it only on horse. They don't uh, take the fight to the ground. So whoever get long through loses the deal. So even in that context, what really happens, uh, they still will never get to a point where they have to wrestle each other, which is why the Chinese situation is completely different to what Japan had to work with. And of course, for the majority of the warfare that happened in uh, you know, olden day China, people don't decide to fight a battle by one-on-one -on -one dueling. Instead, they have their whole army to collide with one another. And if you wonder why, you know, it's quite simply because the, the Hans, the Turks, the Jin, Liao, all those nomad people, they don't have this kind of honor or habit. So, you know, why would they do something that is so impractical in terms of actual warfare? So they're going to just swarm uh, the Chinese and in return, then the Chinese have to swarm them back. So when enemy don't play by this kind of gentleman rule, 
that you can't play by this rule either if you want to survive, which is why this kind of habit also did exist really long ago in China, you know, the, the dueling system, but it, it very quickly lost its purpose due to the constant warfare China has against these nomad people on the northern borders. And often what is considered as a one-on-one -on -one between two famous generals are in reality just one general managed to kill another while the two armies are clashing at the same time. For example, right, according to the Romance of Three Kingdom, one of the most famous generals of the Three Kingdom era, Guan Yu, he one on one dueled against someone from an opposing force called Yan Liang and killed him in a one on one duel. But if you actually check the actual historical record, San Guo Zhi, it actually says that Guan Yu launched Yan Liang at, in the midst of a clashing army, which means that it wasn't a proper one-on-one, -on -one. the two armies collided, and he so happened had an opportunity to kill the opposing general. Now as for medieval European, it's a bit similar to Japanese, although I don't think they have this you know, custom of Ijida, right, one-on-one, -on -one, but they do have the elite warrior class, which is the knight. And the knight usually when they're on the battlefield, they fight the knight. Of course, the knight also charged into enemy infantry rank and kill regular foot soldiers as well. But here we're actually talking about knight using wrestling, which as far as I can tell only happens when two knights are fighting on foot. And of course they have very good reason for doing this. And one of the biggest difference between the European knights versus the Chinese as well as the Japanese is that they have a far superior armor, which is the full plate mail. What's great about the full plate mail is that it's so well designed and protective that it's very hard to hurt someone wearing a full plate mount with regular weapon, right? unless you're using Warhammer, a uh, mace, or pole axe, these kind of armor shattering breaking weapon. Otherwise, if you're using a long sword, it's actually almost impossible to hurt somebody wearing full plate mail. Now, even today, if you look at some of the the full plate mail uh, combat with, with weaponry that you know competitions that people do, you can clearly see that. You know, after a few whacks, they'll basically charge onto each other and go into wrestling range and they'll try to throw each other down. Whoever lands on top is most likely to secure the victory. Right? Similar things would happen back in the medieval European time. Knights will fight each other. Obviously, they will first be on horse and with lances. But at some point, you know, when they use up all the lances, there will be a time where they will come on foot and they will fight each other on foot. And that's when, unless you have prepared armor breaking weapon, if you only have a long sword, then chances are you neither require half swording, meaning you hold the sword by the halfway point, that you have better control of the tip, and use that to get close and to aim for articulation, like gaps between the armor, chinking the armor so to speak, and hurt somebody that way, or you have to wrestle them to the ground and then use a dagger to then either stab them through the eye slit or other, you know, gaps through the armor in order to secure a victory. Whereas, so if we look at this painting again where the Western European knights were depicted in battle, you can see that they, you know, the, they're wearing full plate mail and therefore it makes sense that they will wrestle this guy on the ground and then hold a sword above him for victory. However, this is a complete different situation compared to China. In China, they have never had an armor as great as full plate mail, meaning that their protection is nowhere near as good as a European knight, and therefore hurting or killing somebody is not really an issue most of the time. So next, we're going to take a look at the armor development throughout the Chinese dynasties and see whether or not there's a period where they can't hurt each other unless they wrestle them to the ground. Alright, so firstly, let's look at the Shang Westrow to early spring autumn period. Now, if we already discussed, you know, in the previous part, that during those days, one of the predominant web melee weapon, you know, except you know, but beside archery and range, is called Ge, and it's almost functioned like a pickaxe. And I've also said, you know, already that due to the relatively small area that you can actually stretch someone, there is a possibility that you can charge in as a guy is trying to hack you. The moment you pass that tip you are in safe zone and you can wrestle them to the ground, possibly stab them with a short sword. And on this picture, we can see illustration of the type of armor that Western Zhou soldiers wear. It's pretty much just a helmet and a chest protection. 
the hand, the arm, the legs, the feet are all not protected. And even the chest armor is kind of primitive. It's just a leather uh, armor and they have like a bronze plate put on in front of it. Well, it can probably stop some short melee weapon like sword, but it will not do so well against arrow and other long pole arm piercing weapon. So what's the inefficiency of the Joe Dante's short melee weapon that brings the possibility of doing wrestling on the battlefield, but the lack of the protective gear means that most likely these soldiers would die to arrow or long pole arm before they manage to get into a close range for wrestling to happen. And furthermore, if we add what we've already discussed about the main mode of combat, which is chariot warfare, then it further shows that there's literally no room for wrestling. And on, and on top of that, as you can see in this illustration, they are wearing traditional huaxia clothing, which is long skirt with long sleeve. And again, as I've already mentioned, if wrestling was important, they would have adopted for a type of clothing to wear in combat that are better suited for wrestling type of engagement. Next, let's look at the Han Dynasty armor. So in this picture, you can see it's an actual historical relic of a Han Dynasty uh, armor. And you can see that at that time, it's quite similar to the uh, European chainmail, the early stage of chainmail, right? Not when they actually eventually have chains, but it's small plates that get sewed together with string. And the first thing that you should know is that if you know anything about these type of mail, is that they are not that great are defending against penetration. So if I take a blade and I cut at it, then this little uh, metal plate is gonna be able to stop the cut from entering the body. But if I shoot an arrow at a male like this, or if I, you know, stab them with a lungs, there's a very high chance it will actually go through the gap and knock the little plate aside and actually kill the person wearing this type of armor. And what this tells us is that if you're wearing this type of armor on the battlefield, it's quite easy for any horse lancers to kill you or any infantry soldier with long spear. So there's actually no reason to take the fight to hugging face-to-face -face range. Another thing that you might notice is that it's only a jacket, right? It lacks a gauntlet, it lacks legging, it lacks uh, boots. Which means that even if you struggle to penetrate the armor on the torso, you can still pretty much uh, incapitate the guy by attacking their arms, attacking their leg, you know, stabbing the leg, causing him to fall to the ground, then stabbing the face. The main thing you can do to someone who's only wearing this type of protection compared to the European knight who had full plate mail. And the lacking of gauntlet, bracer, legging, and grief is going to be a running theme throughout Chinese dynasties' armor development. Well, at a later point, there are some dynasties where they had armors that include the bracers and leggings, but gauntlet and grief just simply never happened. And if you're wondering why this is the case, one of the main reason is that China was never that rich in iron war when taking into consideration the amount of population the dynasties had to support. So let's put things in perspective by taking an example. During the Ming Dynasty, around the period of Zhengde Nianjian, the annual iron ore production is around 300 to 400,000 jin. So if you divide it by half, that's around the kilo measurement that we use today, more or less. And at the same time, the Ming Dynasty supported a population between 500 to 600,000 people. So if we average out the population versus the amount of ore they gather per year, it average to about one nail per person. And as you can see, there's very little metal to go around. So under this type of resource limitation, throughout all the dynasties, they have placed weapon manufacturing as the first priority because you need to be able to kill enemies. And second priority is agriculture and farming too. This is because China is one of the largest agriculture countries and has a huge population to support. If not enough people are farming or the farming isn't efficient, people are going to die from starvation. So agriculture too, very important. And only third comes armor production, which means when it comes to making armor, they simply do not have enough resources to make super comprehensive protection. And this is further illustrated by the amount of 
military personnel that each dynasty has to outfit. In fact, throughout most of the dynasties, there's always going to be a percentage around you know 30 to 40 percent of troops that don't even get to wear the standard armor that they were using at their current dynasty. Therefore, when designing armor, how to conserve resource is one of the most important factors. Which is why, in most of these armor design, they only protect the essential part, namely helmet, chest, and shoulder. And when you're a rider, you have some leggings too. Because those parts are most likely to be struck. There's just simply not enough resources to worry about your hand and your feet, and your lower shin and leg. Which is very similar to the common foot soldier from feudal European medieval age or feudal Japan. However, as we discussed, in Europe and Japan, the victory or the outcome of a battle is largely dependent on the performance of the elite warrior class, whereas in China, the outcome of a battle is mostly dependent on the common foot soldier. Another reason that corresponds with the previous mentioned point is that in China, warfare is not about dueling. When you are in a formation where it is, you know, archery, crossbow, or pole arm, the chance of you getting hit on your hand or on your lower leg and feet is far less a concern than for knights and samurai, who most of the time fight other knights and samurais, which means they are in a sort of a dueling position where these extremities are more likely to be struck. And of course, in the Chinese battlefield, if a soldier's hand or arm or shin or leg get injured, then it's far easier to just replace that soldier with the next soldier on the line than to make braces, grease, gauntlets, and you know, leggings for everyone. Because chances are, a lot of these soldiers are going to die anyway, so there's no point in you know, making comprehensive armor for everyone. And given the fact that during the Han Dynasty, everyone's using pole arms already, they're no longer using ge, right, the short pickaxe. Instead, they're, you know, all the infantry are using spear, and they also have a sidearm, which is a long, uh, we'll call it Huan Dao, right? It's a single-edged blade with a, a, a ring in the end of the handle, hence it's called the, the big ring blade. And you know, given the weapon that they are using, uh, there's even less reason and opportunity to get into a super close range and try to throw somebody. Especially if you consider the thing we talked about earlier, that they're all fighting formation. And on top of that, they are mostly fighting against the Hangs, which are all horse archers and riders. And you know, just in case you think that maybe in this excavation they only recovered one piece of the armor, maybe they have you know gauntlets and, and legging. Let's look at the next illustration. So this is an illustration based on historical discovery and record of the Han Dynasty uh, cavalry force. And you can clearly see that he only wears a chest piece, even his shoulder are not protected, and there's certainly no gauntlet and no legging. So even if you overlook the fact that it is a cavalry rider that, you know, his predominant job is to fight on horse, either use archery or lungs, uh, so that he actually wouldn't be on the, on the ground and engage in any kind of wrestling activity. But if he does end up on the ground, it's relatively easy to kill somebody who's wearing this type of armor because, you know, at least half the body other than the torso is completely unprotected. If I had a spear in battle I'm infantry and this guy fall on the ground, I'm going to stab him on the leg to, you know, demobilize him and then proceed on killing him. So, why? risk going in and trying to wrestle with a guy, one can just simply pick him off at a long distance. And of course, when you are a cavalry troop, your hand, forearm, and leg protection are not that vital. Since you are not actually engaging in any type of dueling, most of the time you'll either be shooting from your horseback or lancing people at a relative distance. And the chance of someone else damaging your hand, forearm, or lower leg is much less likely to happen. Okay, after the Han Dynasty comes the Western Jin Dynasty. And here you can see a picture of a madman excavated from a Western Jin Dynasty tomb. And it is a warrior, and if you look close enough, you can see that in this art, art piece, it depicted males on the chest, but smooth on the arms and smooth on the legs. There's a further support that people at the time do not have gauntlet or leggings, or boots for that matter. And here's a picture of a replica of the Northern Wei Dynasty uh, cavalry armor. And come to the previous picture, where the Han Dynasty's riders, the horse are not armored, the Northern Wei Dynasty, you can see that 
the, both the rider and the horse are armored. So this starts to look a bit like medieval Europe, right? This is like the heavy cavalry. And you can see that the armor kind of improved a bit. There's like, you know, a thing to protect the neck, almost similar to knight. However, there are still armors made from small pieces of metal sewed together. It's not a plate mail, which again have the same problem that there's still a chance of penetrating the person through the gap in the armor. And again, you know, the, there's no gauntlet and well, you can't see it here, but the legging is also very primitive. So it doesn't have the same type of protection as full plate mail. So at this point, we're pretty much looking at what is known as Nanbei Chao, right? The, the Southern and Northern Dynasty era of Chinese history, where the multiple small dynasties that took over either North or the Southern side of China in a short period of time. So it's a little confusing period, but the armor are pretty consistent. You can see that over here is another heavy cavalry, and you can see that there's still no gauntlet, but there's some kind of legging, which is an improvement, but there's no boot. So again, there are still important areas that are not covered, such as the hand and the leg. Reason for that is because riders are a more important asset to any Chinese dynasty than infantry, so they require more protection. Also, the riders do have their side or the upper leg exposed when they are charging into enemy rank. It's just like the right height to be attacked by the infantry forces, which is why they do require some form of protection while the infantry troop have much less need of that. So, you know, when they're limited resources, once again, they obviously, you know, make legging protection for the riders, but not the infantry force. Which is why, even if you can't get this type of soldier off the horse, right, which is very, very hard, but let's assume you can, you still don't really have the need to risk a complete melee range wrestling match and then try to stab them with a dagger, you can use a long weapon poem spear to keep them at a distance and then try to pick off their hand or, or cripple their leg and then pick off their hand and also right their throat and their helmet are not completely closed off. So those are also, also vulnerable areas. While they are smaller targets, but if you think about the way Chinese people used to fight with massive formation of, of spear formations, you know, if you miss the head, somebody else would have gotten it. So again, there's no absolutely no reason to really get into a super close range and wrestle someone who's wearing this type of armor. So here's an illustration of a Northern Qi infantry soldier. Northern Qi is also part of the Southern Northern Dynasty of the Chinese historical period. And you can see that the armor is very similar to the riders with the exception that the legs are not protected at all. And again, there is no gauntlet. Next, we'll look at the Tang Dynasty, where Chinese armor design reached its peak with a type of armor known as Ming Guang Kai, or the literally can be translated to the shining armor. Now, there are different versions or designs for this kind of Ming Guang Kai or shining armor. So we're gonna look at a couple of examples. Not all of them are historically accurate, but it should give you a good idea of what this kind of armor looks like. And this represents the best armor that Chinese dynasties have ever made in their history. So in this Ming Guang Kai, you can see that majority of the armor are still made from small plate linked together, but they do have two pieces of full metal, which is like a, almost like plate mail, on the chest. But again, there's still no gauntlet and no uh, boots to protect you know, your lower leg, but there is something to protect the, the thigh, which is a pretty good improvement. Well, here's another a, a, a replica of Ming Guang Kai where it does have some kind of gauntlet and some kind of legging to put on to protect your shin and lower legs. And this starts to look a little bit like full plate mail, except it is not, not plate mail. It's still some kind of chain mail, you know, small plate that got sold together. But the chairs certainly provide definitely a better uh, protection that all the other arm we, we've looked up to this point, right? It's, it's too round disc, and it's much harder to penetrate those, especially when they're round, you know, that given the angle, things can slide off. And here's another replica where, again, you can see that it has some kind of gauntlet and it has some kind of legging. So up to this point, you might think, well, you know, now that, you know, in the Tang Dynasty that they have this kind of better protected armor, then maybe, you know, the soldiers need to tackle the guy and wrestle and throw him down before you can uh, kill them. 
Now while this armor do have some kind of arm protection and legging, it's still not on par with full plate mail, right? Where you literally have no opening other than small joint articulation and eye slit and small gaps where the armor join. In, in this type of armor, there are still places that you can obviously strike. And more importantly, like we've mentioned in the previous part, that during the Tang Dynasty, majority of the time they are fighting against cavalry. So there's just simply no point in coming on foot and going into super close melee range. Another thing that people often ignore or neglect is that this armor is not standard for everyone. In fact, this armor takes between 192 days to 265 days to produce just one set. Which is why even during the peak of Tang Dynasty, these kind of elite armor can only be provided for the most important military personnel. For example, when the famous general of Tang Dynasty, Xue Rengui, went to the north to attack a then Chinese kingdom that occupied the location in presently North, North Korea called Gao Gou Li. Right, Xue Rengui's military consists of 300,000 men, but only about 1,000 and a bit more are able to equip this kind of Ming Guang Kai, the shiny armor. Well, you might think, well, this is pretty much like the knight, right? A elite warrior kind of troop that has you know, far superior armor. But again, the difference here is that they are not the main force that the Tang Dynasty relied their military victory upon. The victory of any military campaign is still largely dependent on the majority of the troops. So even though if resin could have been used, I'm not saying it can, but if it could be used against these people who are wearing the you know, Ming Kai, the shining armor, it is still a very niche purpose to have all the troops now train resin just for that one specific purpose. Where you know in the entire army it's only a couple thousand that actually have this armor. So it's just far less important to actually cater for. The rest of the town troops would wear armor that looks something like this. And you can see that this is very similar to the cavalry armor that I've showed you from previous dynasties, where there's no gauntlet or, or, or full arm protection, and there's no shin and legging protection. It's only the side that are covered. Which means if you are fighting this type of enemy on the battlefield, either you're gonna get long through and die, or by some miracle you got them off the horse, and you and your buddy going to stab him to death without the need to get real close. And during the Song Dynasty, even though uh, the infantry armor got even more protected, right? It is said that the Song Dynasty's infantry armor weighed the heaviest throughout the entire Chinese history, up to 29 kilogram. But it's not the same type of protection that full plate mail provides. And furthermore, if you look at the military record of Song Dynasty, during the year 979, Song Taizong took 100,000 men army and lost against 9,000 riders. 100,000 to 9,000, let that number sink in. That's almost 10 to 1 and they still lost. Against this type of art, the only reason that they could lose is because the Liao army at the time were all riders while the Song army were mostly infantry. So the only way that the Liao people could win in such inferior numbers is because they keep attacking them from range and kiting them and not actually engaging in a full melee combat. So again, wrestling will not have been useful at all in these type of situations. And when it comes to the Yuan Dynasty, there unfortunately are no record of what kind of armor they wear. But from what people and scholars can gather, it's probably, it's probably very similar to that of the Jin Kingdom of Nomad group that came before the Mongolians invaded China. So while some of them do have relatively metal-based heavier armors, a lot of the Mongolian light riders actually wear light leather armor and sometimes even no armor, which is caused by the large amount of troops they have versus the amount of metal they can produce for armor. So killing them on foot without using wrestling shouldn't be a struggle at all. However, as we've mentioned already, the real hard challenge is how to catch up to them and how to get them off their horses. And then, from the Ming to the Qing dynasty, there has stopped to be a change in the armor production. Instead of the really heavy metal armor that the Song people use, from Ming and Qing, they start to make light armor. Eventually, they make armor that are cotton-based, 
with metal keep uh, like you know in between the cotton material would look something like this. And the reason for this kind of change is because of the right to firearm that the traditional armor doesn't really protect that well and the need to be more mobile on the battlefield. If the heavy armor can't protect you that well against firearm, then you might as well just wear lighter armor because that's where at least you have more, more mobility on the battlefield and maybe hopefully you can avoid being in the direction of the firearm volley. But on the other hand, this also tells you that they almost don't have much melee engagement. If there's a lot of melee engagement, then it will still be beneficial to wear heavier armor. But the fact that the armor starts to go lighter and lighter shows you there's very little melee engagement. And should there be any melee engagement, the weapons they have at the time is more than enough to kill somebody wearing that type of armor. So again, negate the need that the, the European medieval knight has where you have to throw the guy to the ground and then stab them in the gap with a knife. With the exception of the heavy cavalry force such as the Ming Dynasty's Guan Yin Tie Ji, which were very important when the Ming deployed the troops to fight back the Japanese invaders on Korean soil. But just as we've already discussed time and time again in this mini series of videos, this still does not warrant an important role to use wrestling in that type of battlefield and mode of combat. So now that we've looked at the armor development of ancient China in a nutshell, uh, we can pretty much see why they did not have a need to fight on the ground like the European knight had to. They just never, simply never had any type of armor that's as well protected as the full plate mail. And furthermore, when we consider the previous two points that I've made, which number one, the scale of war is very different and the lack of a dedicated warrior class where they can train how to fight from childhood and two, the type of warfare they are conducting which is constantly against northern nomad people who are completely full on cavalry. So one can say with pretty good certainty based on logic and common sense that wrestling was never really important in the Chinese ancient battlefield. And this shows you that these Chinese wrestling supporters, how little they actually know about this history and how little research or no research at all that they've actually done. Because if they actually did the research, they will know that most of the points they are claiming to support their point of view doesn't stand and doesn't hold water. The irony of this whole argument is that if one were to pick between Quan Fa and wrestling as a training for military soldiers from back in the days, Quan Fa actually has more value than wrestling, which is why the Ming Dynasty General Qi Ji Guang chose to teach his newly recruited troops Quan Fa instead of wrestling. One of the key reasons for this is simply because Quan Fa has a closer resemblance to weapon usage. Like I've explained in my previous video on the side stance, you know, from the stance to the way they punch to the way they do move. More, many of those moves and even style, you can directly translate them into a, a weapon move. If you give them a weapon, you do the same kind of motion, you can, you can see that it very easily becomes a weapon attack pattern. Whereas if you take any wrestling move, you know, straight out of the box and give the guy a weapon, it doesn't work at all. Now I'm not saying that Quan Fa is useful for olden day you know, combat on the battlefield, right? That's not what I'm saying. Because Qin Ji Guang already stated quite clearly that there are no real use. But if, if Quan Fa has no real use on the battlefield, wrestling has even less. And again, this is not to pull down wrestling by any means. This is just to straighten out what happens in history. Wrestling is still a very good combative technique or discipline on its own. And especially in today's world, it's very useful, especially in the rain and on everyday life. So there's nothing wrong with anyone learning wrestling, but you have to respect history and respect the common sense that goes with historical understanding. And another side note, a lot of these Chinese wrestling people in China today that looks down on traditional Chinese martial arts Quan Fa, you know, they're basically claiming that wrestling is the only Chinese traditional martial art that is combat viable. 
what those people neglect and forget is that Chinese wrestling is only this useful because they took boxing and Muay Thai kick from the West and made Sanda. A lot of these Chinese wrestling people, they prove is that the Sanda champions and athletes train wrestling and they don't train Chinese traditional martial arts. But that only works because they have the striking department covered with you know, a more modernized combat sport approach. If you were to actually take Chinese wrestling from the Qing dynasty straight out of the box with no addition and you put that up against someone who do the old day Chinese martial arts, the wrestling actually isn't going to do that well because it doesn't have striking, it doesn't know how to handle striking. Which is why it's unfair for these modern Chinese wrestling supporters to compare what they have achieved by binding themselves onto Sanda versus Chinese traditional martial art, which to a large scale do not evolve with time and are using outdated techniques. I'm not trying to spread any hate on Chinese wrestling or anything to that effect. All I'm saying is when people are looking at this type of thing, they should use more rational and logical thinking to look at everything from a fair perspective all around rather than you know having a self-interest in one side and severely skew the argument. So that's, that's it for this a fact of fiction episode. I hope you have enjoyed it. I certainly spent quite a lot of time doing research. So I do hope that you have learned something that you didn't know about Chinese history and culture before. And if you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe on my YouTube channel. Make sure you click on the bell icon so you get updated as soon as I make a new video. And if you can support me on Patreon, that will be greatly appreciated. It will help me out plenty and also enable you access to Patreon exclusive content that I prepare for my Patreon supporters. While I don't believe in online teaching, but in my Patreon exclusive content, I do include more information and knowledge in terms of various in-depth look at Chinese traditional martial arts, especially on the four fundamental forces. So if you are interested in looking deeper into the four fundamental forces, then you should consider becoming a Patreon supporter. And as always, a shout out to all my Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for supporting me through this two years of pandemic. I really appreciate your guys' support and also make me feel appreciated and therefore give me more motivation to put more effort into making greater content in the future. And a special shout out to my new Patreon supporter. Unfortunately, I don't know how to pronounce your name, so hopefully I'm not murdering it. Uh, but thank you for Lola, I believe, to join my Patreon channel. I hope you enjoy your stay and enjoy the content I provided. And as always, always feel free to contact me, message me with any questions for existing content or suggestions for future content. Thank you so much for your support. And lastly, I'd like to remind everyone we are still in this pandemic, so keep your social distance, get vaccinated if you can. Hope everyone stay healthy and safe. And thanks for watching Tristan's Martial Channel. I will see you next time.